Okay, thank you. Uh, so, hi everyone, my name is Joanna. Um, I used to be the uh, postdoc uh, researcher for Scotland's Rock Art Project, which is um, what I'll be talking about today. So, uh, Tersha Barnett was the PI, but she couldn't be here, unfortunately. So, I'm filling in for this. Um, the title is Modeling a New Understanding of Prehistoric Rock Art in Scotland. Um, and obviously this is this was very much a, a team work so there are other uh people in 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 the team that also contributed for whatever it is that we're going to be talking about here today um so some of you may have already heard about scotland's rock art project um and may have even heard some of our talks so apologize i apologize I apologize if any of this is already repeated for you. Just for a little bit of context, uh, Scotland's Rock Art Project was a five-year project funded by uh, the AHRC and it was uh, hosted at Historic Environment uh, Scotland in, collab in partnership with uh, the University of Edinburgh and also the uh, Glasgow School of Arts. And it ran between 2017 and 2022. Um, it was a community-led project and the main aims of the project were to enhance understanding and appreciation of Scotland's rock art through community co-production and research, as well as identify and systematically record rock art across Scotland in collaboration with community teams. And you can see in this map um, some of of the areas where we had community teams working with us and the area that they've covered in terms of, of field work and recording. So the recording included the detailed documentation of a number of parameters about the rock art motifs themselves, the type of, of rocks where, where they were carved, the surrounding landscape, as well as uh, accurate georeferencing, which is always useful if you're trying to look for rock art, can be difficult, and also 3D modeling. Um, so we have uh, Sketchfab accounts with all of the, uh, with, with about a thousand 3D models uh, available for downloading and consulting online. So uh, all this work generated a very large uh, detailed database, which we used for our research, um, which was representative of the country's rock art. So you can see in this map, you have the, the, the blue dots are the rock art sites that we knew about initially. So they were just under 3000 when we started, and this was a compilation of all the sites that were in Kenmore, the HERs and other some, uh, private collections. Um, and the red dots are the ones that we that we've recorded in, um, in situ. So the community teams, as well as um, the scrap team uh, during this uh, this uh, this period, we had a little bit of a, of a hiccup there because there was a little thing called COVID and we really couldn't go out. Uh, but in the end, we uh, investigated um, just over 1500 uh, panels in situ and recorded them uh, in situ. So, um, but what is prehistoric rock art? I'm sure, again, that most of you will have heard of it, but this is uh, in, in, um, in Scotland, we have one main uh, tradition of, uh, of, of rock art, which is carved. Uh, it was created roughly um, between the Neolithic and the early Bronze Age, the local Neolithic and uh, early Bronze Age. It's entirely composed or mostly um, of abstract and geometric motifs. Um, we have lots of cup marks, cup and rings, which are the little um, hollows with the, the, the concentric rings around. Um, and these are the, the, the best known um, motifs of this rock art tradition, but there are other, other variations. Some of these panels are quite simple, so they have one motif or just a small uh, number of, of them, uh, but others are quite exuberant, they are quite uh, complex, and they have compositions with uh, lots, of, lots of motifs uh, in specific arrangements. They were typically created on flat or gently sloping and low-lying outcrops and boulders in the open landscape, and uh, they were often found around farmlands or hillsides and generally accessible areas in the landscape. Um, the majority of these motifs were produced through pecking, uh, which essentially implied uh, hitting the rock, the rock surface with a stone tool. Um, and this rock art tradition is also part of a, of a wider uh, tradition that is known across the Atlantic Europe, which we uh, generally call Atlantic rock art.
So we had a number of research questions uh, to address um, for, for the project. We were looking at chronology, social and cultural context, but also the connectivity and how this tradition spread across uh, the, the, the territory that is today Scotland. Um, and we investigated this large data set with these questions in mind using this multi-scalar um, approach, which focused essentially on three different levels. So we have a small scale that was looking at the motif specifically, so uh, what they looked like, um, their design, the variations within these images, the carving techniques. Uh, we had a medium scale of analysis looking at uh, the, the, the rocks where they were created. So whether we're talking about um, outcrops or, or boulders, um, the types of arrangements of motifs, the variations, and also the relationship of these motifs with uh, the rock surface and, and the natural features of the rock surfaces. And finally, we had a large scale, which was looking at uh, patterns of landscape settings. For example, the relationship between the rock art and natural elements, as well as contemporary monuments that surrounded the rock art. Um, and we were particularly interested in confirming or dispelling some assumptions that had been carried throughout uh, the research biography of Atlantic rock art for quite some time regarding the, the, the landscape location. So, for example, there were a lot of, um, th there still are in place a lot of ideas that th the rock art would be attached to uh, routeways or uh, that they, they, they're supposed to be located in places with wide visibilities or intervisibilities and relationships between them and so on. And we wanted to, um, check all of that. Um, so the combination of these three scales of analysis enabled us to look at the carving tradition in a lot more detail. So while we were looking at each of these elements independently and in a lot of detail, because we did gather a, a very detailed um, database um, for, for the rock art, we were also able to formulate a wider picture a wider understanding <clears throat> for the creation use and the context of, of this rock art. And for this talk, we will be focusing specifically on this wider picture um, and what, what, we, what we gathered from it. So the small, the small scale analysis, uh, through the small scale analysis, we were able to identify motif micro variations. Uh, that is small details in the making of the motifs, which were repeated in several regions across Scotland. So the detailed analysis of motifs of, um, and these small variations enable the identification of similarities between carved panels, local preferences and possible connections between regions, which you can see in this, um, in this kind of chart on the site. Um, so this is a trend that had already been identified in, in, in my previous work across Atlantic Europe, um, which began to indicate some wider connectivity between these regions that were really far apart. Um, so the chart shows uh, the overall preference of motifs depicted in Scotland. Uh, on the right, we have some of the regions. Is it your right? Yeah. Uh, some of the regions where each of the motifs are more prevalent, reflecting also some local preferences. And with these data, we began to build a picture of relationships between these areas, which was reflected in, in the rock art. Um, and obviously, this could then be explored further with other types of archaeological features and artifacts, which is something that we also did. Um, so we began to have some clear regional preferences emerging with a tendency. So we find that there is a tendency for simpler compositions towards the north. There's a predominancy of, uh, uh, of arrangements of cut marks. Um, specifically in, in the Highland region, which doesn't mean that there aren't other more complex compositions as well. Uh, and then we have quite elaborate compositions towards the south and the west. Um, and there seems to be in, 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 the center, in the central area of the country around the, the area of Perthshire, there seems to be this transition area where both of these, let's say, sub-traditions, if we wanted, kind of seem to meet. Um, and this was also um, visible in terms of the medium scale of analysis, where we have a preference for um, carvings on boulders more towards the north. They're the red dots on the map and also and then outcrops um, towards the south. And then if you see here, this kind of medium central kind of region, there seems to be more an overlap of these uh, of these preferences. And we also figured that there are other types of features like colors and textures and that were also influ that also influenced this uh, um, selection of of the rock media. Um, and then we finally we performed a number of spatial and statistical analysis to the landscape. I only um, kind of described them here. I'm not going to talk about them in detail. Um, 
And this also sh and, and, and this all showed that deciding where to carve would have been a really important first step in the process of making this rock art, uh, whether because the artists were looking for the perfect rock with the perfect uh, surface characteristics, because sometimes they really valued the bumps and the lumps of the rock to be able to create specific arrangements, um, or because they were really interested in specific um, landscape features or other cultural features that were around. Uh, and uh, and we were able to um, well to ascertain that the landscape and the location of the rock art was certainly part an important part of the message that uh, that this uh, the whole assemblage was was carrying. Um, so as you can see here, we looked at a number of natural and cultural variables, and then we had different patterns emerging throughout the country. Um, there are regional variations, there are significant regional variations, and this suggests that although the different communities understood the rock art tradition, they knew how to create it, they knew what the imagery was, was like uh, and how they were supposed to use it, they had their own preferences, which probably reflected their own cultural beliefs and their, and their cultural backgrounds. Um, so the use of this multiscalar methodology enabled us to focus independently on each of the components, as I said, of the rock art tradition, such as the motif morphology, carving techniques, the rock surface characteristics, relationships with landmarks. Uh, and this provided us a really good understanding, detailed understanding of the tradition. And it showed us things that and, and gave us access to types of information that we didn't have before, especially with the use of 3D model because it provided 3D modeling, which provided us with a lot of detail in terms of the design of, of these pictures and so um, of the design of the carvings. And so we were now interested in investigating further these interrelationships interregional relationships between between the rock art, uh, since we had already identified some regional preferences, differences and similarities through a presence absence uh, matrix. And we also wanted to find quantitative methods for classifying the huge amount of, of data that was being produced and and uh, and recognize some key patterns. So uh, we applied two statistical methods following advice from Javier Rubio, uh, Rubio Campillo, who was uh, at the time here in, in, in Edinburgh. Um, which enable us to assess the data sets relationally uh, and um, include data that was produced for each of the scale of, for, for all the scales of analysis uh, without having to um, consider any geographical constraints or other biases. So we used a multi-response permutation procedure, an MRPP, and a multiple correspondence analysis methods to analyze categorical data and compare motif co-presence, co as well as identify shared characteristics between the panels in our samples. And the aim was to determine how and to what extent the different scales of analysis influence clustering and patterning within the data. Um, we, we, we apply these two methods uh, three times with variations on um, on the data. So we had three subsets of of, of the data uh, of the data set for for, for each of these uh, approaches. One of them, we were looking only at the data resulting from the uh, the landscape analysis that we did. The other one, we were looking at the data that was uh, produced only from the uh, small scale, so just the motif analysis. And the other one, we combined all the data uh, that we had. Oh, I've already changed slides. Um, so since much of the data that we worked with was categorical, the multiple correspondence analysis or the MCA was useful to summarize the large amount um, of data and reduce numbers um, which we had in a reduced number of dimensions. So the MCA um, analyzed the, um, anal analyzes the data according to similarity and looks at how variables are correlated, highlighting factors which contribute to variance without having to predetermine groupings. And this is something that we were very interested in in looking at the data without these kind of geographical constraints and um, having to put bias in the, in, 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 in the grouping. Um, and so, uh, the output is a factor map and which shows the variability within the data set as organized in clusters. And in this case, uh, this is the motif variability, identified panels which contribute to this variability and it identified two main clusters, um, two main clusters, as you can see. So we have a black one and we have the, the, the red color. You can't really see, but they have the numbers of each of the, uh, of the, the identifiers for each of the, uh, of the, of the panels. Um, so these are not regionally defined, that is the panels from both clusters occur in the same areas. We have cluster one 
is which has a more widespread um, is more widespread than cluster two, and there are two visible outliers. One being classified as its own cluster, which is the top one, which is located in um, in uh, in uh, in Lorte. And the other one um, as belonging to cluster two, but slightly misaligned, uh, which is Townhead in Dumfries and Galloway, which is the picture that you can see underneath. Um, and then we consider the landscape variables only. Uh, and this procedure identified four main clusters, which correspond roughly to geographic regions. So we have cluster one, which is largely confined to Dumfries and Galloway. I'm not sure that you can see the maps, I apologize, they're a bit small. Um, and then we have um, cluster three, which is mainly uh, around uh, Lorte, cluster four, Perth and Kinross and the Highland, and cluster two is more widely distributed, so it's more kind of, uh, um, I suppose that the variability is, is, is more similar um, across the country. And then when we combine the motif and the landscape analysis, we, it, the, the result produced a more dispersed plot. Um, compared to the motif variables on their own, the clusters are less contained, but still expressed as two main groupings. And again, we're dealing with clusters that are not regionally defined, although the regional character is clearly making a contribution to the unique character of the rock art in each area. Um, and this is something that, as we will see, corresponds, was also reflected in the MRPP analysis, which also identifies the brace of, Bal of, of Balogh um, as an outlier. Um, so the motive analysis only indicated two large uh, motive trends across the country, and the MCA analysis of the landscape variables indicate a greater regional variation in terms of landscape location. When we combine the motif and landscape vari uh, variables, we get a more dispersed version of the first plot. And this means that the homogeneity we see within the motifs is broken up by the heterogeneity of the landscapes. And so we complemented the MCA analysis with the MRPP analysis. And this analysis provides a test as to whether there is a significant difference between two or more groups of sampling units and requires fewer assumptions than other comparable parametric approaches, although in this case we did have to input some boundaries, so we had to use the councils um, as a determining factor. Um, and so I'm going to go straight to the uh, results. Um, sorry? Okay, thank you. Um, so. The uh, table on the left shows the mean dissimilarities within each council area. Um, so what we see here in terms of the value is, so the blue areas are the ones that are more similar and, the, and they just get more dissimilar the, the further up they go, the redder they get. They get. Um, the table on the left shows the mean dissimilarities within each council area and how many panels were used for each calculation. And on the right, you can see the heat map. And as I was saying, the value refers to the scale of the similarity where zero means identical and one means completely different. And if there was a clear group structure in the data, we would expect to see the lowest values, so the dark blue going horizontally. This is certainly not the case for the analysis of the motive variable, variables only. And this makes sense because if we think back at the results from the MCA, the motifs are not regionally defined. And in other words, there is not a clear regional group structure when we only consider the type of motifs. When we look at the landscape variables in isolation, the average distances expressed through the heat map see, seem to indicate a certain group structure, which um, with some areas emerging is more similar than others. And in some cases, there seems to be a group identity, although in many cases, the landscape features are all very similar. And finally, when combining the motif and the landscape variables, the results lie somewhere in between the, the, previous, the two previous results. The observed de uh, delta in relation to the expected insinuate less group structure than when considering only the landscape, but more group structure than when considering only the motifs. So whilst there is a group structure materializing, this is slightly weaker than we just considered lands um, when considering just the landscape on its own. And this means that there is less group structure than the landscape um, only results. Um, so it's interesting to note that both the MCA and the MRPP analysis show similar trends. The MCA and the, M the MRPP analysis were able to confirm some of the conclusions that we achieved with other spatial and statistical analysis. None of the analysis identified specific patterns for the motifs, which as seen do not seem to be regionally defined, demonstrating that they are widely present across the study areas. There are, however, some regions with a uh, slightly more marked identity, for example, across all of the calculations, Tyree, which is 
that little square expresses a particularly strong group identity standing out from all of the other regions. Um, so the MCA and the MRPP analysis were used to bring all the variables and components of the rock art that we studied independently and in detail together in, a, in this relational approach in order to create a comprehensive narrative of the rock art. What it showed is that while the motifs were were known widely, there are two main trends of groups of motifs, but little patterning, which means that the iconography was used in a relatively homogenous way across the country. However, there are patterns emerging from the landscape analysis, and these, when combined with the motif analysis, show more variation in the local preferences and differences and similarities between the region can be teased out. The various analyses that we carried out within our large and landscape scale demonstrated um, analysis demonstrated, including through testing for significance, that many variables were significant for the landscape location of the rock art. And this seems to confirm the idea that although the motifs were clearly important and therefore repeated extensively across these vast territories, the place of the rock art was a very important feature. Um, and also these analyses also reveal a picture of a shared understanding of Atlantic rock art across Scotland, even in areas such as the Highland, where it took us, where it, for us, it looks slightly different than the more classical examples of the tradition. Um, and these regional commonalities and differences may indicate networks of connectivity through which the idea of rock art spread across Scotland. Sorry for overrunning. Thank you.